this question that is both a really important practical question for computing and a really deep theoretical mathematical question that causes people to go, go crazy and change their worldviews. We want to understand what are all the things that can be represented by strings of bits and what are the things that cannot. Last class, we started talking about natural numbers, so we'll continue from there, building up from that to get to this question about infinities and try to understand what are the things that can and cannot be represented by finite strings of bits. We defined natural numbers last class. What about sets? Can we come up with a, a definition for sets? So these are good definitions of what a set is, right? So if we understand a set as it's some collection. It's a collection where we don't care about order. Something can only either be in it or not be in it. There's no count. It's not a bag where we can count the number of times. What I want to see if we can get to is something more like the constructive definition that we had for numbers. So we said we could build up all the numbers starting from zero, and all we need to create all the numbers is a successor function. These descriptive definitions of sets are useful, but they assume we know what a collection is. So in some sense, defining a set as a collection sort of assumes we already know everything we need to know about sets. So any other ideas how we can build up a definition of sets? It's either the empty set or it's a, another set with an additional element appended to it. Good, yeah, right? So this is very analogous to the definition we had of numbers. So we have a base set. Our base set is the empty set. And there are different notations people use for the empty set. Usually it's not empty set in quotes. The two most common, the zero with the slash, and the set brackets with nothing in them. And we will probably use both of those. We're going to try to mostly use the zero with the slash as a, a special notation for the empty set. So once we've got the empty set, how do we build up more sets from there? Good, yeah. So what, what should we union? So union is kind of like successor. It's a way to add things to sets. What should we union the set with? Let's assume we, we have some notion of things, right? So we're going to, if, if something's a set, from a set, when we union things into a set, we get a set. So x could be anything. Then we're going to say s union. So what are we actually unioning with? Is it with x or with something else? Yeah, a set containing x, right? So if we had an insert operation, if you think of sort of the set functions in most programming languages, there's one that is like union that takes a set. There's one like insert that takes an element. And we haven't de really defined our set operations, right? This definition is assuming we already know what union means. But if, if we know what union means, we've got to create a set that contains x and do our union. This would make us a little nervous and uncomfortable. Our constructed definition of set is assuming we already know how to make a singleton set, and we already know what union means. If we were really building things up from scratch, we would have to define those things in a way that allowed us to use them. As an intuitive constructed definition of a set, this, this makes sense. Does this construction produce a new set? Is S union the set containing x a new set, or is it the same set that you started with? Yeah, it depends, right? It could produce the same set. It doesn't always produce a new set, which would also make us a little nervous, right? If we're saying we can build up sets from the empty set, we would like a construction that always is going to produce a new set. But this seems like a rule that we could produce all sets from, if x could be anything. x could certainly be another set. I'm going to tweak this a little bit to change the rule to this. So now we don't need an x, right? That rule was kind of uncomfortable because it required drawing this x from some mysterious universe that we might not have defined yet. So now we're going to avoid that. We're going to say define the empty set, which we'll denote like this. And we're going to have an inductive clause that says we can construct a new set by unioning s with the set containing s. Is that going to allow us to build up interesting sets? So certainly it's not going to allow us to build everything we intuitively think of a set as a set today, right? So we think of the set containing one, two, three as a set. This is not going to allow us to build, build well, will it, will it allow us to build something that we could think of as the set one, two, three? 
if we think of these as a way to represent the natural numbers, so zero is a set, what's the next set going to be? Well, the only set we have at this point is zero, is the empty set. So that means the set, this union, the empty set union, the set containing the empty set, what would be a better way to write the set of the empty set union, the set containing the empty set? It's just the set containing the empty set. We union the empty set with something, we get what we ha had. So we can erase that. What's the next set going to look like? This might be a little hard to say verbally. It's going to be a different set. It's not the same set, because it's going to be a set that now has two elements. It has the element, the empty set, and it has the element, the set containing the empty set. We can keep going. We can think of this as zero, this as one, this as two. Are we convinced we can build up something that represents the natural numbers this way? Yeah. Is this definition limited to the cardinality of the natural number? This is kind of the fundamental question we're going to get at at most of the class, so maybe I don't want to try to answer it now. This set, in, in some sense, is exactly the same set as the natural numbers. It's just a different notation. If we haven't assigned any other operations or meanings to these things, this is exactly the same set as the natural numbers. So in that sense, it should have exactly the same cardinality. But what is that? Is that construction? That's construction, not a storm, right? OK, we're OK. The hurricane is far, far away still. This looks like another way of saying, well, Let's get rid of that mysterious successor function, which we used last class to define the natural numbers, and use something that seems more familiar that we already know, that's the union and set operations. And now we can define the equivalent of the natural numbers. It's kind of a weird notation for writing the natural numbers. This is not, uh, I don't think I did the brackets right. It's a, it's a hard notation to see what three looks like. Some weird bracketed way. I think that is right, that is three? Okay. It's going to be hard to count much higher than three like this. But in theory, we can count as high as we want. It's a good representation of the natural numbers. So both of those are different sets of rules for constructing objects. We can construct mathematical objects using those two rules. And they're really similar. In some sense, these are really the same sets of rules. They're just different notations. And our intuition about what adding one means, or what successor means, or what unioning means, those are meanings that humans add on top of that. But in terms of the mathematical definitions, they are equivalent other than the notations at this point. If we start assuming other operations on them, well, then we can define them in ways that make them different.